thank the park for uh, including me in their lecture series. It was, uh, it's a real honor. Um, I want to start off by saying, I, in my opinion, my humble opinion, I think kayaking the islands is probably the best way to see the islands. Uh, there's lots of places uh, you can't get to on foot uh, or even in a boat. You actually need a kayak to get into all those uh, nooks and crannies, all those nameless places that are on the map. Um, so I'm going to start by uh, going through my uh, images here from quite a few trips. Um, started circumnavigating the islands in 1999 and uh, haven't stopped since. Um, been to quite a few places around the world and I think the Channel Islands are right up there as some of the best there is to see uh, throughout the globe. Uh, this image, this first one here, uh, this was a couple of years ago. Uh, this is Willow Anchorage on the uh, backside of Santa Cruz. And uh, let's see if I can work this here, the laser. So I got dropped off right here at Yellow Banks and uh, paddled all the way along the backside of Santa Cruz and hit Water Canyon in here at about dark. So roughly a 30 mile day um, by myself. Um, but it was a good day. There was no, virtually no wind. It was, you know, it sounds like a long ways, but time goes quickly because it's so beautiful out there. Um, there's so much to see. You just never know what you're going to see. Uh, but in my opinion, this is one of the prettiest anchorages on the on the back side of the island. Uh, those two big rocky pinnacles, there's nothing like that on the back side. Uh, it's, uh, it stands out like nothing out there. Um, there we go. This one I call the pyramid. Uh, that's a friend of mine. That's Craig Fernandez down there on the, uh, on the right, right at the surface of the water. And this is actually uh, a big pinnacle between uh, Diablo Canyon, which, oh shoot, sorry. <laughs> um, it's right around here somewhere. Uh, it's a very uh, volatile area. There's a lot of current in there, and there's been lots of times where I haven't been able to paddle between the island and that pinnacle. It's just uh, a lot of water moving around in there. Uh, so it was relatively calm that day, and this was during a, a circumnavigation of Santa Cruz and uh, Santa Rosa. Um, I don't know. Do we have a way? Can you move the map over there to that corner where there's a light? <laughs> we got a. All right. Okay. Good boy. <laughs> All right, we'll figure this out sooner or later. So uh, Diablo is right around here. Uh, so up towards the west end. How far from Painted Cave across there? Um, Painted Cave's uh, right here. Oh, my. Oh. It's right here. Um, so Diablo's down here somewhere. Willow is over here. So 
whenever I do a, a circumnav, uh, it's pretty rough right along here. There's a lot of water moving around. Uh, a lot of times it feels like you're paddling a river. Um, and once you get past Diablo, then it, it kind of settles down, typically. Uh, but it's just a lot of exposure up there on the west end. Um, but this was, a, this was probably a, a week-long trip. And that's me going solo from uh, Santa Rosa back to the mainland. Uh, so that's Santa Cruz right there. That's me approaching the west end of Santa Cruz. So uh, if you look at the map, it's, uh, I took that shot right about here, right out there in the Santa Cruz Channel. And uh, that's been listed as one of the top 10 most dangerous channels in the world. And, <laughs> and uh, the potato patch is right in here, and that's probably the, the big reason why that is. Uh, but on a day like that, it was pretty much butter all the way across. So uh, it was actually one of the most boring paddles I've ever done. It was about uh, 30 plus miles from Water Canyon. Uh, Water Canyon is right here. And I bounced off the island there and then headed right there to home. So it was about a nine hour day. And uh, like I said, it was one of the most boring paddles I've ever done. I didn't see anything other than a rhinoceros ocelet. Um, let's see. I'm using a sit on top. It's an old uh, uh, dolphin made by Necky, and uh, that, that's it right there. That's been the boat of my choice for a long time. Yeah, I got really good hatches. Easily, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's me just getting some lunch on the back side of Santa Cruz. Um, there's some beautiful spots back there. I don't re remember the name of this beach, but it was up above, uh, just west of Willow. A couple, couple anchorages up. No, this is way past Coches. This is way west of Coches. Might be Laguna. Uh, this actually, this shot appeared on the cover of Canoe and Kayak magazine in August 2014. And uh, this is myself and uh, the guy in the foreground there is Fraser Kersey. And then uh, there's another guy right there. That's Garrett Kababic. Uh Those are two of my bosses at Channel Islands Outfitters. And uh, this was going to be a trip that they were going to sell to people. Um, the trip would begin at Prisoner's Harbor on uh, the front side of Santa Cruz, and then uh, the next stop would be down at Scorpion, and you'd spend the night. And then uh, from there, you would go over to Anacapa and uh, spend the night there. And so when we did this trip, we started out with 10 guides, and uh, four of us finished. <laughs> so the reason being uh, is because the wind came up, and it got up to about 40 knots. And uh, we were supposed to camp on the island on Anacapa, but it was virtually impossible to set up a tent. So we slept on the cobble at Frenchy's Cove. And um, we had to build like a little fort with all our kayaks because of the wind. And a couple of the kayaks blew off in the night into the water, but we were able to get them. <laughs> and, uh, it was so bad that I knew it was really bad because the pelicans, there was a couple of them that uh, landed inside the four kayaks. And, uh, was that three or four years ago? This is about six years ago. And two of the birds just walked right past us and stuffed their heads in the bushes and went to sleep. And, uh, and then about 4 a.m., it was like somebody uh, shut the window and the wind stopped and you never saw four guys move so fast in your life. They, everybody just stuffed everything they could in their kayaks, and we got the heck out of there. And uh, we got to the mainland before it started to blow again. And this is on that same crossing. This is on the way into Oxnard. And it's always nice to see uh, common dolphins while you're paddling out there in the open ocean. It gives you a little bit of a warm, fuzzy feeling, even though you're all wet. Uh, 
and this is uh, last November, and this was not a warm, fuzzy feeling. Um, this is a solo trip, and I was uh, heading out the day before work uh, last November. And uh, I got out to the oil derricks, and I was riding uh, on top of a swell. And the swell coming at me, the next one, there was a big dorsal fin um, cruising across. But I wasn't able to confirm if it was a great white or not because I never did see the tail dorsal. But it did move like a shark and uh, made me wake up and put my camera away and uh, just concentrate on paddling. My head, needless to say, was on a swivel. Uh, but I never did see it again. And that you can see uh, there's a ship right there. So I'm just starting to move through the uh, shipping lanes. My head, I was just looking over my shoulder the whole time. Constantly. Uh, this is a long time ago. This is about 1999, and I'm coming from Santa Rosa into uh, Kyler Harbor on San Miguel. So, right about here. So I started out the morning over here somewhere. And then I paddled up Santa Rosa, and um, I was able to uh, get up on the bluff with my binoculars and look across, because you really can't tell when you're that low in the water what it's, the crossing is going to be like. So I got up on a bluff with my binoculars and uh, looked across, and it was brilliant conditions. And, and then by the time I got to the island, it started to howl, and it was a fight just to get into Kyler Harbor. But uh, then I had three days of bliss out there because the weather was just phenomenal. It was beautiful. And then on the return, it got horrible again. And I uh, flipped the boat over out there between the islands, and uh, a little bit of a yard sale ensued. Uh, this is a, a photo I call knowing when to say when. And uh, this was probably two or three years ago. Was by myself uh, paddling. Uh, I'd already gone around the backside of, of uh, Santa Cruz and Rosa, so this is day three, and uh, I was looking to go to San Miguel. Uh, but this is only about a three three mile crossing, but it was pretty treacherous. I, I'm about a quarter mile off the island there, off Santa Rosa, and uh, the wind was starting to whip up something fierce. Uh, the next day it was 47 miles an hour and uh, gusting to 60. Um, and so this is the same afternoon I took that shot, the previous shot. Uh, this is Arlington Canyon on the front side of Rosa. So up here somewhere, roundabouts. Actually, it's right inside here because that's Brockway Point. So it's right inside here. And uh, you can see my kayak right here. Uh, so that's it's a it's a great spot for a lot of reasons. This is where they discovered uh, Arlington Man, the oldest human remains in North America. Uh, so roughly thirteen thousand two hundred year old femurs that they found up the canyon here. And uh, I can see why whoever that was liked it there. Plenty of water running down into this freshwater estuary before it hits the beach. And uh, great lookout. Um, but there are a lot of shoals out here. And when the wind whips, up, wind whips up and the swell kicks up, waves break out here. And that's what I experienced the next morning. Go ahead. Arlington Canyon. So it was OK right then. Uh, but things started to get rough. Um, this is another trip. This is uh, getting out of the wind. So over here is the ocean to the right of the image. Uh, that's myself and Craig Fernandez. And we were paddling up the backside of Rosa. So just. Uh, just before, just after, let's see, west of Cluster Point, um, right around here, 
and then between B Rock and Cluster Point. So right around here, we had stayed here. And once you get around South Point, uh, you can see whether it's going to be rough or not. The water gets really dark. You get a really good idea what the wind line looks like. And um, that's what happened to us. We didn't get very far that day. So uh, we hightailed it uh, to this beach, landed, drug everything over the dune, and just stayed right there all day against that bluff out of the wind. We were both freezing. We were both hypothermic, actually. Okay. So this was uh, last a uh, year ago, last April, and uh, my one of the guys I was with here, this guy here, Will Miller, uh, and Patrick O'Hay, uh, they were former. Uh, uh, they were on the national rowing team, and Will was in the Olympics in 2012 in London, and uh, we've been doing some trips together out of the islands and other places, and. Uh, I knew the day we were going that it was going to be a gale out there, and they had aspirations of paddling around the islands. And so I knew that wasn't going to happen as, uh, before we left the harbor. Uh, and they weren't totally believing me, but uh, they did once we got there. Um, Betchers is over here, and uh, I told them when we paddled to the campground, which is over here to the left, to hug the island because once you get on your board, you're going to take off like you're windsurfing. And um, they almost nearly missed Betcher's, the beach there in here. And so here's Will paddling back uh, into the wind. A stand up paddle board. So uh, they're both big, strong guys, and they were able to pull it off. Um, and Island Packers doesn't allow hard boards, so those are both inflatables. Sure. No, you can't start a fire on the islands anyway. Uh, just get in a sleeping bag, get in a tent, and sit in the sun. Yeah. So this is uh, Will and Patrick again. This is the next day. And uh, this is uh, Cowboy Arch, as it's known. And it is right in here somewhere. This is, this is Carrington right here. And Cowboy Arch is in there. And uh, it's not an easy place to get to. Uh, luckily, it was flat, but the wind was up. But we were able to get in there. And uh, we were on our way up to uh, Lobo Canyon, and Lobo Canyon is around Carrington. And it's the first anchorage west. It's not really an anchorage, but it is a cove. And you can get in there and hunker down. But it was so cold, we couldn't even stay there, so we had to turn around and come back. Basically, it was a gale force wind with sideways rain. And How were they carrying their gear? Well, our gear is all at the campground at this point, and we're just doing a day trip because they finally realized that we were not going to go around the island. So we were fortunate just to get as far as we could at Lobo Canyon. But when they were carrying their gear, how did they do it? Um, I took a bunch of it in my kayak, so they didn't have to. Because I'm, it's a lot easier for me to paddle because I'm lower on the water and I have all the hatch space. And so I took most of the gear. They had some um, on them, but uh, I had most of it. Uh, this is on the way out to Lobo, so a uh, bunch of sea lions there, and they're always curious. Uh, this is near uh, a place called Kawadi Point, and Kawadi Point is doesn't really show up on this map. It's this rocky finger inside of Carrington, uh, but there's a huge uh, sea lion haul out there, and we were you know way off the point, but these are all a bunch of youngsters, and they're all full of themselves, and so. Uh, they like to see what's going on out there. All right, so uh, this is Arlington Canyon. And uh, there's a few friends there that I didn't know they were going to be there. Uh, so you can, you can see uh, out on the horizon, it's looking pretty nasty. 
Uh, this is the day that was blowing 47 and gusting to 60. And I was basically stuck there. And uh, I woke up uh, in the morning, and there was these four uh, northern elephant seal pups uh, cozying up to the kayak. And um, I was trying to figure out what the heck I was going to do, because uh, I needed to be at a guide meeting in a couple of days. And, and so I was thinking, well, should I or shouldn't I go for it? And I went for it. And uh, the first attempt, I got washed to the beach. And the problem was, if you look at the map, um, this is Brockaway Point. And so it was really hard to get off the beach there. And the current and the wind was moving so fast, it was pushing me into Brockaway Point. So I needed to clear that uh, to make it around and out. And um, I was having my doubts after I got washed in the first time. Really got hammered. I got hit by three or four waves and was on the beach before I knew it. Uh, so I just decided to charge it and go right back out and uh, made it outside. But between there and Carrington Point, I probably got uh, launched out of the kayak somewhere between five and 10 times. And uh, the weather radio was spot on. It was calling for uh, seven to 11 foot uh, seas and so the interval was really short and the troughs were very steep. So uh, I got to Carrington Point eventually and uh, started aiming towards Betchers just to take a break and got near Kawadi Point and uh, I was about a quarter mile off the island and to my left, right next to the kayak, a wave started to suck up and break and then the whole ocean in front of me started to boil. And so there's a lot of rocks. And I whipped the kayak around really quick and took two waves full on back to back. And I thought for sure I'm coming out of the boat and it's just going to be a mess. Uh, but somehow I stayed in the boat. And I said, the heck with the, uh, the break at Betcher's. And I just went all the way across the channel to uh, the west end of Santa Cruz. Came out of the boat probably another five or six times, uh, especially in the potato patch where it was really rough. Uh, my neck was sore from looking over my shoulder the whole time. Um, had a leash connected to my paddle, so that was a good thing. I didn't have to worry about swimming after a paddle, to just a kayak. And uh, finally touched down at Cueva and uh, took a break and then went all the way to prisoner. So it was like a 35 plus day. Are you tethered to your plant? No. Wow. No. Uh, I really don't want to be tied to it. I'd rather just swim after it. It's pretty heavy. It's not going to get too far away from me. No. No. No, it doesn't get that far away. It's got <laughs> food and all my, you know, my tent and sleeping bag and pad and all my camera gear and Everything else, water. I had a long sleeve, short leg, spring suit on with a spray jacket, and uh, that was it. Nothing on my feet, no. So this is actually the day before that last picture. And uh, these were two of my tent mates. <laughs> So there were no animals on the beach, and I pulled in there right before dark, and I was pretty tired, pretty stiff. Uh, pitched my tent, ate, got my sleeping bag, and wrapped up, and uh, there was a full moon that night, and I woke up in the middle of the night, and I realized that I could not roll over on my right or my left. <laughs> and so I had two on my right and one on my left, and... Uh, they were making all the noises that they make, like, yeah, all kinds of things. Um, and they weren't, they were totally fine. What was amazing was that the tent didn't collapse because it was bowing in all the way and the poles didn't snap. Um, and the one, uh, one of them, I don't know which one it was, but one of them kept putting its face right next to mine, just the 
tent wall was <laughs> separating us. But amazingly enough, uh, everybody went to sleep. And uh, <laughs> I didn't need the sleeping bag. There was plenty of insulation. <laughs> and I slept the whole night. Uh, in the morning, that's when I took this picture. I unzipped the tent. And these two were right there in the entrance, so I went out the back. Um, and then there was probably 50 of them frolicking out in the water. A lot of first-year pups, they don't make that migration back to Alaska. Uh, they're not strong enough, so they stay put. And uh, that's what these uh, were called wieners. That's what they were doing. So very sweet-looking, teary-eyed, puppy dog faces. Um, and they didn't mind uh, hanging out with me. Well, kayaking out of the islands wouldn't be the same without these little rascals. Uh, they get into everything, the island fox. Um, they inspect every kayak. At the ki this is at the kayak site at uh, Scorpion Anchorage. If anybody, if anybody doesn't know where that is, that's it right there. That's the most visited spot on the islands. and. Uh, so the foxes are very used to people, and we're trying still to get used to them. Um, they get into everything. So he's, this one's looking for food, obviously. Yeah, that's what a lot of people say. They're only about three or four pounds full size. Um, they've been on the endangered species list since 2004, but I'm thinking they're going to come off uh, the endangered species list pretty soon here. Um, Carrying capacity is still unknown, but there's about 2,500 of them out on Santa Cruz alone. And uh, they're flourishing out there, even though we're experiencing a drought. Uh, and right now, there are a lot of foxes out there. Uh, they are into everything. Um, unfortunately, they're omnivorous. So out of the island, they're supposed to eat crickets and mice and land birds and reptiles and things like that, but unfortunately, people are careless, and guides included. Um, they get, they're, they're smart, they're crafty, and they're fast. Uh, nothing now. Here's an island fox doing a little dumpster diving at the kayak site. I uh, have no idea why it was going in the box. There wasn't any food in there, but it needed to go in there and check things out. This was like its third attempt. We kept chasing it out, and it kept jumping out of there. And this kind of shows you, it gives you an example of how uh, nimble, how cat-like they are. This is a, uh, an old fig tree uh, in the back end of the lower campground behind uh, the guide site. We have our own campsite out there and uh, last fall there was heaps of figs uh, so th these branches aren't real strong it's a, it's a quite a balancing act uh, but they have no problem weaving in between the branches and uh, getting to the uh, the choicest fruit uh, there was also a lot of birds in there too it was a great bird watching spot last fall there's a guy, hardworking. Uh, that's uh, Tam Lorn Chase. He's one of the guys for Channel Islands Outfitters. And uh, like I said, uh, the foxes, they come right up to you. They're always curious. Uh, this photo I call the blob. Um, this is Potato Harbor. And it's right about here on the map. It's in the marine protected area, just like Scorpion Anchorage is. And uh, that's my friend uh, Craig Fernandez and I. We were coming back down. We were just about finishing a trip coming down Santa Cruz from prisoners. And uh, we pulled in there just because it's one of the prettiest places out of the islands, I think. Um, and we hit the beach, and I noticed this bait ball of fish that was forming in the back end of the beach there. And so I told Craig to just ease his kayak out there and see what happens and see if they congregate around you. And sure enough, uh, this bait ball kind of formed around his, him and his kayak. I don't. You know, silverfish or minnows, I don't know. 
This is also a potato harbor. Um, this is during a trip that I was leading. I had these uh, four girls from Taiwan. And uh, we're sitting at a little lunch spot right here that we made with the driftwood. And uh, we're sitting there eating, talking, and this juvenile brown pelican just flew in maybe just two or three feet in front of us and landed right there. And the girls were freaking out. They thought that it was going to attack them and take their food. And, and uh, I was like, no, it's just sometimes they get a little confused uh, when they're growing up, when they're trying to uh, figure things out out there. And uh, so he, the bird just sat there. And then I went over and sat next to it. And uh, it was just sitting there. And then I started stroking its breast. And then I started scratching his head, and then his head flopped back, and he took a nap. <laughs> and so the girls were going crazy. They were filming all this, and they started calling me the Pelican Whisperer. <laughs> so when I stopped stroking his head, it woke up, and then he flew away. So this is uh, at dawn. Uh, Let's see here, right here. I don't know if you can see that, but it's, we're leaving Santa Cruz Island. Uh, that's Santa Kappa. That's where the sun's coming up. And we are, where is Santa Barbara Island? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Santa Barbara Island's down here. So uh, we paddled from here. Tell me about it. <laughs> it's, uh, it ended up being about 50 miles. Uh, so that uh, the guy paddling there, that's Tony Chapman. Maybe some of you know him. He's been a guide out of the islands for a long time, uh, close to 30 years at least. And uh, Tony asked me uh, about maybe a year and a half, year, nine months ago, uh, to paddle with him to Santa Barbara Island. And um, I told him I would do it. And so we had a plan laid out. We were going to leave at 3 in the morning and uh, start our paddle across. And, but then we found out there was live fire exercises going on. And so we had to wait until 6 o'clock in the morning and let them finish. And so Tony said he would take care of the uh, navigation portion of the trip. And I, I agreed. I, I uh, trusted his experience uh, being a guide for such a long time. Uh, but as soon as we got out there between Santa Cruz and Anacapa, I started having some reservations about the direction that we were taking. Um, I've been to Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara Island lots of times, um, so I didn't feel right. And I kept asking him along the way, hey, are you sure? Are you sure? Because, I don't know, something doesn't feel quite right. And he was reassuring me, yeah, we're going in the right direction. I was like, okay, okay. So about seven hours of paddling, I could still see Santa Cruz over my right shoulder. And uh, now I was getting really worried. And so I said, Tony, let's, uh, let's go have a talk with the Navy vessel captain or the tugboat captain that was pulling the targets. They were still out there. And so the, the Navy vessel was way off too far away. We couldn't hail him, but we got the guy, the captain on the tugboat, and uh, he told us we were heading too, too steep. We were heading too far southwest, and we weren't heading south enough. So we were actually heading towards San Nicolas Island, which is about 60 miles off the coast. And uh, he told us we needed to be heading in. We were going about 147. We needed to be going at 126, and that was uh, the direction we needed to go. So uh, we we were both maybe a little deflated. It was about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and then I asked the captain, how many miles more do we need to go? And he said 26. And uh, I was like, okay, we got to get moving here because it's going to get dark. And uh, we had already told uh, the ranger on Santa Cruz that we were planning on being to Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara Island at 6 p.m. Uh, we weren't even close. So... Uh, off we went. Uh, st I started paddling faster, and I thought Tony was going to be able to do the same. And uh, uh, I kept having to stop and wait. And 
And uh, then I had to get the nerve to ask him if I could put him on toe so I could at least paddle at my own pace. And uh, he agreed, maybe a little reluctantly, but I was glad that he let me do that. And uh, so that was about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, about 6 o'clock it got dark. And I had my wetsuit on up to my waist, and I just peeled up the rest and was fine. And uh, I had to help Tony get into his. He had his trunks on, but he was sitting on his wetsuit pants. So I had to help him get into those because he was pretty stiff at this point. Tony's probably, he's, Tony's 77 now. Um, so then he was about 75. Um, and so I had him on tow, and we're going, and now we're in the right direction. Uh, but really didn't have any reference point as to where we were going. And, but then the moon popped up out of the east, and it was a nice bright moon. Uh, you couldn't see the mainland for a long time. It was really hazy. We were way out there. And then, uh, and then it got real dark, and there was a star in the south. And Tony said, if you stay on that star, that's right where we need to go. And so we continued on, and I kept keep an eye out for the beacon that's on Santa Barbara Island. And I kept, it was kind of like being out in the desert where you see things and they're not really there. And I kept thought I was seeing a light. Uh-oh. Kept thought I was seeing a light and it would be there and then, and then there was nothing. And then I would see it again and then there was nothing. And I was going, oh boy, I'm going cuckoo. Tired, hungry. Um, and then about 8 o'clock at night, uh, I felt Tony's line go slack behind me, and I thought it had snapped. And uh, he came up behind me, and he said, it just came untied, and he needed to retie it. And so while he was doing that, um, I didn't realize that he didn't have a leash on his paddle. And uh, while he was retying it, he dropped the paddle in the water, and it was gone. It was a... You know, black shaft with dark red blades. And so right when I was about to lose my mind, uh, I turned and looked, and I saw Satil Island, which is this, uh, this big giant rock outcropping just southwest, I'd say. It's, it's about an eighth of a mile off Santa Barbara Island. And uh, that's what I was looking at. And, but I couldn't see Santa Barbara Island. It was uh, covered in fog. And I was looking for the beacon. And so I was t asking him, uh, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Because we were still about eight miles away. And uh, he says, no, I don't see anything. And I was like, Tony, you've been spotting dimes on the water all day today. You don't t you're telling me you don't see this? And then he saw it. And, and then we were both very you know, relieved and happy and all that. And, and while we're paddling, you know, we could hear the rangers on Santa Cruz and the seabird biologists on Santa Barbara Island. They were really concerned for obvious reasons. And um, so I, when, we, when we figured out we were there and we saw the island and the fog moved around and I saw the beacon, I was like, okay, I can do this last eight miles with him with no paddle. Um, go ahead. Uh, yeah, we're low on the water. We could hear them. They couldn't hear us. We tried them. Uh, eventually, we did uh, reach a boat. We don't know where it was, but they relayed a message to Santa Barbara Island. And uh, so it took me another two and a half hours to paddle that eight miles. So it ended up being about a 50-mile day, 17 hours on the water, and six hours of towing in the last two and a half hours with no paddle. With, for Tony. He had the compass. He had the compass. And we were using that star, that southerly star. No. Um, so the seabird biologists were terrific. They were right there at the dock. There's a landing dock there. There's no beach there. There's no beaches on Santa Barbara Island. Uh, so Tony and I were pretty stiff when we got up the ladder. I had to help Tony up the ladder. And uh, they were kind enough to uh, let us sleep in the bunkhouse. We didn't have to pitch tents or anything at midnight. Um, 
I got up pretty early the next morning and made Tony get up so we could paddle around the island. I could take pictures. <laughs> <laughs> he was, he was, uh, he complied. He was, he was a good sport. And uh, that's Tony out there uh, on a lunch break. Don't ask me where. We're just out there somewhere between the island. Uh, that's long before he lost the paddle. Oh, oh, but you said you had oh. the paddle the island. right. Uh, there's two kayaks on the dock, that, and there's a little boathouse there, and so they have paddles there, and we just borrowed one. Uh, but this is uh, during the paddle. This is midday, and we're getting lunch. Well, you are fun, right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a job you quit, right? That's right. It's a good job. No, we borrowed a paddle to go around the island. And then in the next, that day was Island Packers' last day to come out to Santa Barbara Island, and that's what we took in to the harbor. We didn't paddle back. <laughs> but I will say, if I didn't see Santa Barbara Island by 10 p.m., I was going for the coast. That was my only choice. So that would have been probably a 90-mile day. And I wouldn't have got there until the next day, obviously. Um, if I had been fortunate enough, I was pretty tired at that point. So this is Sutil Island. This is just off Santa Barbara Island. There's uh, there's Tony being a good sport right there, and uh, we paddled around the island, which is beautiful. It's it, it's Santa Barbara Island is only one square mile. It only takes you know an hour and a half to two hours to paddle around it. And there's Tony. Uh, Sea lion rookery there is amazing. It's arguably one of the most entertaining uh, rookeries. Uh, there's thousands of them on the uh, on the south side or the southeast side of the island. And so that's uh, this is on the southeast side of the island. So there's a blowhole there that works like a fire hydrant when the swell's running, and there's a good south swell running. And so the sea lions come and go. They kind of use it to cool off in. They get up there on the bluff and they bask in the sun and then they come down and uh, they wait for the blowhole to fire off and it blows, it fires off all day when there's a swell like that. I think that's it. So if you guys have any questions, I'll... Yeah, we're going to open up for a question and answer period. Again, just uh, wait till I bring the mic to you. I know it was a little bit of a different thing during the talk, but <laughs> just wait till I bring the mic to you and then um, I ask your question. So, we'll start over. What do you have against uh, having a GPS? <laughs> uh, it's kind of the same thing with my film camera. I don't use digital. So, um, using a compass is, I don't know, like the old school day, I guess. I'm curious about your selection of a sit on top versus a sit in sit uh, kayak. Good question. Uh, so I do a lot of photography from my kayak, and uh, a closed deck boat is rather restricting. Uh, sit on top, I can move around in it. Uh, I can move all over it if I want to. Uh, so I just keep my camera gear in my lap in a dry bag. I don't use a housing. I just throw a leg over either side of the kayak, and that also enables me to stabilize the boat. Uh, that much more, especially when it's windy out. Uh, some of those shots you could tell I took in the chop. And uh, so to sit on top, it's just more, I feel like I'm in more control. You, in Arlington Canyon, you'd mentioned the, the freshwater estuary, and I was curious, are there, are there spring-fed creeks, or is it just runoff creeks during the winter? Um, there's a lot of uh, springs out there, a lot of natural, natural springs out there. Uh, if you know where to go, and I do most of the spots, uh, I don't need to bring much water with me at all. Uh, even in a drought year, there's still plenty of water out there. That's a, the Arlington Canyon, that spring, that's a year-round deal there. And there's several other places like that, too. Uh, do you have to notify the park service where you're going to go ashore and spend the night, or can you just 
stay anywhere on the island. No, you can't stay anywhere. Um, Santa Cruz Island, uh, most of it's owned by the Nature Conservancy. They don't want anybody camping on the island. Uh, but over time, I've been able to just paddle the whole length of Santa Cruz and then over to Santa Rosa Island. And Santa Rosa Island, certain times of the year, allows beach camping uh, at certain spots. So some of those spots... Uh, So this time of the year, uh, March through September, there's no landing, no camping or anything like that at Skunk Point because of the western snowy plovers. Uh, and then once you get up here, uh, once you get East Point, you can, you can camp there. And then all along here, you can camp. And then once you get up here, you have to pick your spots. Uh, you're not supposed to camp where there are seals and sea lions hauled out. And because there's so much... Uh, overcrowding of that out on San Miguel, uh, especially northern elephant seals. They're starting to colonize uh, the backside of Santa Rosa. Um, there's uh, a colony at Cluster Point, and then uh, there's several uh, fingers out here at Sandy Point, and there's some nice beaches there, and uh, they like to haul out in there too. Um, you don't really don't see elephant seals much at all on Santa Cruz Island every now and then you get one that's off course and it's usually a youngster um, and we see maybe one or two a year that make it there by accident uh, but San Miguel um, has a campground and that's a, about a 24 mile paddle to go all the way around the island so that's very doable um, you know when you're paddling out there uh, Sooner or later, you're going to run into some big wind. It's just, you're just no avoiding it. Um, some trips are better than others. So I kind of have a follow-up to that. So if you do get in trouble, how does the Park Service feel about you taking shelter? <laughs> um, well, I don't know how it happened when we uh, had to, camp at Frenchie's. I let my bosses handle it. Uh, they talked to whoever at the park service and they were fine with it. I mean, they would rather us play it safe, you know, and if it was rough like it was, it was blown 47 that day. Um, they would rather we uh, pitch it right there on the rocks. We didn't pitch any tents or anything. We slept out. We just barricaded ourselves in with the kayaks best we could uh, and to stay out of the wind. Uh, so they understood. I think, for the most part. You're obviously a world-class athlete. Most of us, uh -huh. they go out to the islands. We go for the day and explore the sea caves and this kind of stuff. Uh -huh. I've assumed that you've been in most all of the caves, and you probably have some wonderful, wonderful pictures of those. I do. I was sort of expecting to see more of that today, but it was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. I've been in... A lot of the caves. There's well over 200 documented sea caves between uh, Anacapa, as small as Anacapa is, there are a lot of great caves out there. And then, of course, Santa Cruz. There's nothing on the backside, not too much, maybe one or two. Uh, but all up along here, there are some massive grottos. Um, You've got to be really careful, especially the further. Uh, West you go, you get a lot of exposure up there, the wind and swell, and you don't want to get trapped inside uh, some of those caves. they got some uh, real deep chambers, and uh, you really have to be on the ball when you're caving. Um, when you're with the island foxes, then can you touch the island foxes? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, you shouldn't touch a wild animal. Um, you know, a lot of times they come up to you. They're not afraid. The Chumash used to keep them as pets. Um, so there is something there. There is a connection there. Um, but they will come right up to you. I've been lying in my tent, and I have all the fox prints to prove it. They literally walk right up the wall of the tent and got up in between the rain fly and the roof, and I'm just lying there looking at them going, it's just me in here, you know. 
there's no food in here, but they're so curious and they're so adept, you know, they're so cat-like. They literally walk up the wall of a tent like we walk up a flight of stairs. It's nothing for them. Have you seen any of the um, sea stars coming back, the Navi Ogre sea stars? That's a good question. Um, have been seeing a few. I've seen a few out on uh, Scorpion Rock, um, right off the island here, off Scorpion Anchorage. Um, and a few along the way out to Potato Harbor. So, you know, within the marine protected area. Uh, but it, it isn't a lot. It's just a few. I would say no more than 10 I've seen the last uh, few trips. But uh, they seem more visible when the tide's really low. Um, I don't know the name of the parasite, but a parasite wiped them out. And it's been a couple years now. Denso virus, if anyone's curious. Yeah. Thank you. Have you, is this on? Have you had any uh, encounters with, uh, close encounters with whales or sharks out in the open sea? Um, I've never seen a great white out there. Um, I have had a really cool encounter with uh, gray whales paddling from uh, in the middle of winter, I think it was February, I was at the campground here and uh, I was on an assignment for backpacker and I was doing these hikes to East Point and Cherry Canyon and uh, I told myself if it looked good I was going to go and head home and it was nice and glassy and I could see the whales out in the channel and so I paddled, took off and there was uh, two adults with a calf. And I didn't approach them. They approached me. And at one point, the tail of one of uh, the adults was underneath my kayak. And uh, the calf was in between the adults. And they were basically sunbathing on the surface. They were, very, they were really mellow. They were just barely rolling on the surface. And uh, but then I just continued on, hit some Riso's dolphins, and then headed for the coast. Still waiting for that killer whale encounter in the kayak. So what's the longest you ever paddled in one stretch? The longest oh. in terms of distance and hours? Well, that would have been Santa Cruz Island to Santa Barbara Island. It should have been a 42-mile paddle. It ended up being about 50. And that was about 17 hours. Too long. I do, I always wondered about you know, the length and the time doing that, especially with everything that happened. And about a month after our trip, uh, I read a, an account in Canoe and Kayak Magazine about a guy named Matt, uh, I'm gonna butcher his name here, it's Kreisen or Kreisen. And he's a sea kayaker up in uh, Half Moon Bay. And he did the whole California coast in 36 days. And uh, so he finished a month after our trip. And in his account, he said the hardest stretch uh, or one of the hardest stretches of his trip was the stretch from Santa Cruz Island to Santa Barbara Island. It took him uh, 15 hours, and he was in a closed deck boat, 18 and a half feet long. So he had a real sleek boat, and he didn't have to tow anybody. So I felt a bit better after <laughs> knowing what I endured, what Tony and I endured. I might have missed it, but uh, what, do, what do you do uh, uh, when you're not uh, kayaking for fun? Um, well, I'm a lifeguard in Carpinteria, and uh, I'm a kayak guide out of the islands. And then uh, I'm also an editor of a surfing ocean-related magazine called Deep. And then I do a lot of freelance writing and photography for lots of different magazines and newspapers, websites. I looked at your kayak and I thought, that wouldn't have room for all the food I'd want to eat. <laughs> what kind of food do you bring mm. to pack enough food for those extended trips? Um, kind of big on dry salami and dry cheese and crackers and uh, uh, dried fruits. I like dried mangoes and uh, instant oatmeal. Um, you can get 
freeze dried mangoes and bananas and other things and uh, trail mix and uh, there's some good uh, freeze dried meals that a company called Mountain House, I believe. Uh, they're really good. They're, they taste good. I mean, it's not one of those things where you so have to wait till you're so hungry that you can enjoy it. It actually, <laughs> you know, it tastes good. Um, so there's some good stuff out there, actually. Um, I always like to have, uh, especially when I know I'm going a long ways, I like to have a lot of stuff right on my chest. So pockets in my vest or, or stuff down between my vest and my chest. I like chews and things to keep my mouth moist while I'm paddling, something I can just suck on. Uh, and then plenty of uh, fluid. So I, I'll use emergency or some other you know, uh, energy drink uh, and try not to stop. Just keep throwing down, keep something in my mouth, and keep moving forward. Um, so like that day I paddled from Rosa back to Carboneria, I never stopped because I was a little bit wigged out, uh, you know, just because of great whites and things like that. Um, and then, of course, the ships. Of course, when you're crossing the channel, you know, the worst thing is the fog. Um, I, the first time I paddled across the channel, I was with three other guys, and uh, the fog rolled in right about here. And everybody wanted to quit, and I was like, no, we're not quitting, we're going. And we got out here just before the shipping lanes, and uh, this image showed up out on the horizon, and, and it looked just like Anacapa Island. I was like, oh my gosh, look how fast we've drifted. <laughs> and, you know, it was the fog. It was just like out being out in the desert again. It was just playing tricks on our mind. And uh, we were really moving fast. I thought, wow, we're really, this current is ripping. And next thing you know, here, the ship came into view. And then there were six more like it. And uh, the last one we hailed on the radio, and he told us exactly where we were. And we were right eight miles off the middle of Santa Cruz. So we didn't see the island that day until we were about a mile away. So it was just talk about monotonous paddling in the fog. It's just really old. So there's a bunch of us here who are sailors. And we've been out and about. And we know how fast it can go from flat water and no wind to 20 miles an hour. So what's your worst experience along those lines? Because you had to have had at least one where you thought you were going to die. <laughs> I don't know if I could ever say I thought I was going to die. Um, I thought maybe something could happen where I could lose the kayak and um, I might have to swim for it, but I never think I'm going to die. Um, no. Get, you know, you just, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Just put my head down and get it done. Um, well, the biggest stuff. Uh, there's a guy sitting in the audience here. His name's Dave Glazer. He's right there. He and I got into some nasty stuff. Um, we got stuck. And we were on Santa Cruz. And uh, we were out at uh, Fraser Point, And we had to get out of there. It was going to blow for days. And I was like, we're not staying here. We're going. And uh, we needed to avoid this right here. West Point, and we were right here. And so we needed to get out in a way so we didn't get swept into that cliff because it's, it's a nasty looking cliff. It's a, it looks like something out of uh, Lord of the Rings. And uh, so we needed to paddle into the wind, into the potato patch. It was about six to eight foot, the surf. And uh, we needed to paddle out and then just make a hard right and then just ride it down. Um, that was pretty heavy, and then the heaviest stuff, I think, was just that solo paddle around Rosa and then getting trapped at Arlington Canyon and, and uh, trying to get off the beach. I, re that was, I really had doubts I was going to get off the beach, especially after I got washed in the first time and stuff was all over the place. I lost a whole bunch of stuff. I found it, but I had to reattach it and, and uh, make sure and then just paddle like there's no tomorrow. Um, and then again, around Carrington and where I almost got destroyed at Kawadi Point, I thought, I'm going to take a real beating here. Um, 
and I wanted to rest, but I was just like, I was so freaked out. I was like, I'm going anyway. I'm going all the way to Santa Cruz right now. I don't care. Um, I just wanted to get out of that spot. It was really a scary spot to be in. Have you ever have you ever needed a water purifier for drinking the water out there? No, I've always just drank it. <laughs> Own behavior. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for coming tonight. Let's give another round of applause to Chuck here. Thank you.